If you haven't done so yet, make sure you pause the video and reread the problem before listening on. Ultimately, in this question, we have to find the coefficient of static friction between the climbing shoes and the wall. And in order to do that, we're going to need to draw a free body diagram showing forces acting on the climber. Now, we've come down here and we've represented the climber as a long extended object with a center of mass located at that purple dot. And because that's the center of mass, we can begin drawing the weight force acting on the climber. The weight force will act at her center of mass. We can label that force W for now. Now going back to the problem, it states that this cable or this rope has a line of action through her center of mass. So where the rope connects to the climber will be at her center of mass. So we go back to that center of mass and we can draw a tension force acting on the climber. So we'll extend a vector in this direction. We'll call that T for tension. We're actually going to extend this vector all the way to this vertical axis here because that angle was given to us in the problem. They represented it with that Greek letter phi, so we can write that in there accordingly. Now there are a couple of additional forces acting on the climber. We can see from the picture that the wall is pressing against her feet. So you can imagine as she presses against the wall, then in response the wall presses back on her. It's a Newton's third law force. We can represent that force by showing a vector indicating the force that the wall exerts at her feet. That is essentially a normal force because it's a surface pressing back on the object. So we're going to label that a normal force. And then finally, the climber, her shoes have a tendency to want to slip down the wall, which is of course not so good for climbing, but luckily there's friction. So even though the shoes want to slip down the wall, the friction actually pushes up on the shoes to prevent them from sliding. That's going to be a static frictional force. So we're going to label that force F with a subscript of S. There was another angle indicated. It is the angle between the climber and the wall, so we're going to label that angle theta. So that completes our free body diagram. Now in order for us to proceed, we're going to have to set up a couple of equations here. And the first equation that we can set up would be a Newton's second law equation, and we're going to be doing this in the x direction first. So in the x direction, we're going to be able to say that the net force acting on the climber is equal to her mass multiplied by her acceleration in the x direction. Now, of course, she's in equilibrium, so the acceleration is actually going to be zero. So we'll be plugging that in for A in just a moment. But first, we need to look for forces that are acting exclusively in the x direction. Remember, we're analyzing the x direction right now. We can see that the normal force clearly acts in the x direction. As for the tension force, there will be a component of tension that is acting in the x direction. In order for us to see that, maybe we should draw in those components. So there's going to be an x component, we might just call that Tx for now, and then there's going to be a y component that we will call Ty. We are interested in the x component at present, so let's highlight it. And if we study the diagram carefully, we hopefully can see that the angle marked phi right here is going to be the same angle there. That will also be phi. Those are basically what are called corresponding angles in geometry. So we're going to label that phi. And from that right triangle, we can see that the Tx is opposite of phi. So because it's opposite, we would use the sine to represent that. Now, if that's a little tricky to see, we can come out and do it more formally here. We can say that the sine of angle phi is equal to the opposite, which is Tx, over the hypotenuse, which is T. Multiply both sides of that equation by T, and we would see that T sine theta, excuse me, T sine of phi, is equal to Tx. So, in summary, for the net force in the x direction, we have the normal force, Fn, that's pointing to the right, so it will be positive, and then minus the x component of tension, and that was T sine of phi, and then the body is at equilibrium, or in equilibrium, so this equation will equal zero. So that's one equation for the x direction. We're going to be uh, doing something similar for the y direction. So let's look at the forces now acting exclusively in the y direction. We have that static frictional force going up. We have the y component of tension going up, and then we have the weight of the climber going down. So we begin by saying F net is equal to the mass multiplied by the acceleration in the y direction. We have the upward static frictional force minus the weight force, and then, my, excuse me, then plus the ty. Now again, go back to that little right triangle, and you can see that the cosine of phi 
would equal the adjacent side of ty over the hypotenuse. Multiply both sides by t, we can see t cosine of phi is equal to ty. So we're going to fill that in for the y component, that ty, which is pointing upward. It'll be t cosine of phi, and then this is all set equal to zero because, again, the body is in equilibrium. And now before we can proceed in finding the static friction coefficient, we're going to need to develop a torque analysis. So let's clean up the free body diagram. And to develop a torque equation, what we'll do is we'll select a pivot point. Now when you select a pivot point, you're going to want to select a pivot through which a large number of forces is passing. So down here we have two forces that are passing through that point, Fn and Fs. That's going to be a very good selection for a pivot point because again, we want to select our pivot to maximize the number of forces passing through it. And the reason for that is because those forces will produce zero torque. So any force passing through the pivot point will not produce any torque. So we're going to be able to eliminate these two forces from our torque analysis. So here we go with that torque analysis. We can begin by simply saying that the sum of the torques is going to equal zero, because again, equilibrium. And then we have two forces. Let's consider tension first. Now tension is pulling on the climber, and it would be rotating the climber in a counterclockwise direction. So that torque is going to be positive. And what we do is we take that force of tension, and we multiply it by the distance to the pivot point. Now, we don't actually know that distance, but we could simply label that as L to represent a length all the way up to her center of mass. So that would be L right there. So we take the tension, we multiply it by that distance to the pivot, which is L, and then we multiply it by the sine of the angle between the tension and the climber. So in other words, we want this angle right here. Now, we haven't marked that angle yet, but if we look carefully, we can see that we have in our picture a triangle, and the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. So the angle marked here would actually be 180 degrees minus theta and then minus phi, and I wrote those backwards as I spoke them, but 180 minus phi minus theta, that will be the correct angle. So we're going to fill that in for that angle between the tension force and the climber. There we are. And now we look at the weight, and the weight would actually cause the climber to rotate in a clockwise fashion. That means it's going to be negative torque, and then we do the same kind of thing. We take the force of W, multiply it by the length to the pivot point, and then we multiply that by the sine of the angle between the weight and the climber. Now let's clean this up just a little bit, not that much, but the angle we're looking for right now would be this angle right here. And hopefully we can see that that angle is alternate interior to this angle. So we've marked that angle as theta. That means this angle is also theta. So the angle between the weight force and the climber is theta. So we will fill in sine of theta, and we can set this equal to zero because of equilibrium. Now what we're going to do is solve this equation, this torque equation, for the tension t, and we will see why that's useful momentarily. So let's add the WL sine theta to both sides and then divide both sides by L sine of 180 minus phi minus theta. And then we can see that the L's will actually cancel out here, so that's pretty convenient. So now we have this equation, and this tension equation is going to be later on substituted into our two force equations down here. Let's recall that those force equations each contained a tension T in them, so we're going to end up at substituting this expression in for that tension t in just a little bit. But first, let's just step back and remind ourselves that the static frictional force is going to equal the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force. Now, if you take that equation and divide by the normal force, you would be able to isolate the coefficient of static friction. So the coefficient of static friction is going to be the static frictional force divided by the normal force. Now take a look at your force equations, and you should be able to isolate both Fn and Fs. So let's go ahead and do that. In this first force equation, let's add the T sine phi to the other side. And then in the Y equation, let's add W and subtract the T cosine phi from both sides. And then we'll make a substitution. We're going to be plugging this expression in for the normal force right there, and then we'll plug this expression in for the static frictional force. And then remember, as promised for the tension, we're going to be plugging in this expression right here. So we're going to do that very carefully. But for both of those tensions, we'll be plugging in that expression that we just circled above.
So there's that substitution. And just to be clear again about what we just did, we took those two tensions there and we substituted in that expression for those tensions. So it's a bit of an algebraic kind of whirlwind here, but what we'll do next is we'll factor out the W from the numerator because we're going to be able to cancel it. So if we pull out a W in the numerator, then we would have 1 minus, and then we have all of these trig terms here. So sine of theta times that cosine of phi, and then that's all over that other sine term. And that is indeed nifty because now the W's will cancel. We don't need to know the weight of the climber, and then we have all of the angles given. If we go back up, to the question, the theta was 40 degrees and the phi was 30 degrees. So let's go ahead and plug those in. Now go ahead and carefully type that into your calculator and you should get a coefficient of static friction of approximately 1.19. That is indeed the correct answer to this question. I appreciate you enduring that.